Tony Lacoste is visiting us from the aquarium, and Jamal. Tony Lacoste has been a spokesperson and the media relations director for the New England Aquarium in Boston since 2001. He considers himself a journalist for the aquarium, responsible for, collect, for effectively telling the stories through mass media outlets. More commonly, Tony works on the strategic placement of stories in TV, print, radio, and web to promote the aquarium and the cons conservation of marine life. Tony has developed stories that have been picked up by thousands of media outlets worldwide, positioned, art positioned articles in national newspapers to affect public policy debate, and has been interviewed on national TV. Thank you. Can we hear everyone? Um, uh, my goal here today is uh, I've actually uh, worked uh, here in, uh, in TV news here in Boston for five years, and then I crossed over, which is a not uncommon uh, tactic for people who work in the profession, to work on the media relations or the public relations side uh, of either uh, a corporation or, in this case for me, a nonprofit. Um, the attraction I had from the New England Aquarium was that when I worked in TV news here in Boston, uh, if you're new to Boston, you might just think that the aquarium is just that, just an aquarium, a, a large tourist attraction, or as we often think, it's a giant fishbowl for kids. But the New England Aquarium actually is much more. Um, we're a very pr a prominent marine animal rescue organization. Um, we actually pioneered the concept of it. It uh, didn't exist until the year before the aquarium opened. And the reason for that is, again, in terms of here, the proximity here in Massachusetts is that Cape Cod is just such an enormous peninsula that sticks out into a really rich marine environment that we have actually the second largest number of marine animal strandings in the world. Um, there's only one place in New Zealand uh, that actually has more. And now those kinds of strandings can be everything from a large whale uh, to uh, schools of small whales, to dolphin strandings, uh, to sea turtles. Uh, and particularly right now, one of the things that you'll be seeing in the next week or two is that uh, sea turtle uh, populations are in decline all around the world. And what we'll do is we'll have large numbers of sea turtles strand on Cape Cod in the next three weeks. Um, we'll have anywhere from uh, 25 to 150. And it's very arbitrary. We really don't know why. It's probably got as much to do with currents as anything. Um, but that story will be coming up uh, at some time. Uh, in the near future. Usually, you can almost set your watch to it. December 31st to January 1st, we'll have sea turtles on the north side of Cape Cod who are going to become hypothermic because they're cold-blooded versus you as being warm-blooded where you have a constant body temperature. As a cold-blooded animal, they're, they're going to assume the environmental temperature around them, whether it's air or water. Water temperature's cooled down enough, they'll get to the point that they can no longer swim or locomote in any way, and what will happen is, is that they'll start uh, washing up. This one's a here we go. Um, my background actually is I'm not trained as a journalist and I'm not trained in media relations. Um, I had uh, um, gone to school. My background was actually in applied economics and in history. Um, what I had grown up though doing was that I had grown up with a, a family culture where a lot of people did tell stories. And particularly my father would uh, very often tell stories about the community and he'd connect things. That's an important skill, if it's something that you're going to be doing in terms of working in the media, is that there's often a statement, we, say, we talk about at the aquarium, that a good generalist actually can be as valuable as a good specialist. Because generalists will have the ability to be able to make connections. Um, so it's the kind of thing, oftentimes, somebody might decide that they want to be a marine, a marine biologist. They'll get into a PhD program and they'll back out. They'll decide that hardcore research isn't for them. And then they might just uh, finish off their master's, but then go into a science writing program. That can be a common outlet for that. For me, what I had done is I had finished my undergraduate work, and then I worked in the outdoors as an outdoor professional for 15 or for about 20 years, uh, mostly working for Howard Bound all over the United States and Canada, but also uh, uh, working uh, at universities, both at Dartmouth and at the University of New Hampshire teaching. And so in this particular case, what I did is I came come to Boston, took a job here, but I'd always been interested in mass media. And at about 35 years old, I had, uh, uh, was still talking about it. And an older sibling gave me a hard time and said, well, when are you going to do something about it? And uh, so I, I did that. And I actually sort of did the unorthodox move, made a career change at that point, and started working in TV news here in Boston. Uh, and I started working at uh, NECN, which is the cable news network for New England. Um, my background, my ability to do that was largely a function, again, I was a good generalist. I knew New England, I knew Boston exceptionally well. So it was the kind of thing I was able to go in and work as a, uh, as a news editor and immediately be able to bring a lot of resources and a lot of knowledge to that table. 
Um, I stayed there for a couple years. Media is very tough. Um, the way that you basically uh, advance in terms of position and salary is that I then went to Fox, which was uh, talk about uh, uh, going to the dark side. Uh, and Fox was just launching in Boston. It was in the, about 1997-1998. But it actually ended up being really great and critical training for me. Uh, New England Cable News is sort of classic old journalism. Uh, very highbrow, uh, long format in terms of what they're trying to do. And, uh, and, we, and, and in fact, sort of your goal was actually to always get the best analysis. It was a talking heads kind of format. Um, that was what you built that your stories around. Um, when I showed up at Fox, I was absolutely apoplectic. The first day that I was there, I was landing all kinds of interviews and they said, we're not interested in those interviews. We want the videographers and the reporters to go out and, and shoot visually to tell the story. And I literally almost wasn't clear in terms of what needed to be done. It took me a while to be able to do that. And Fox was on the far extreme. But actually, as in most things, being able to be able to take both skill sets and be able to apply them into the middle, into the norm, was something that would serve me well in terms of being able to do. To be able to know the importance of the visuals, to be able to tell the story, but also be able to take the narrative that people can do and be able to provide that context. Um, so that was uh, uh, the next big thing. I ended up actually, after about a year, moving back to NECN. Um, the, in terms of another position that opened up there. Um, it also, Fox's type of news wasn't my cup of tea, but it was good for me visually in terms of being able to learn more. Um, after uh, about five years in the business, I uh, decided that if it was an opportunity to move out, that I would. I enjoyed it with my colleagues and the people I was working with, but the stress level of working day to day in TV news is, is that it's always there. If I, if I come in at 1.30, by the time usually I was done at 7 o'clock, I had done six live shows. Uh, that I had a major part managing. So for me, the, the attraction then came is that I knew a lot of the work of the aquarium in terms of its marine animal rescue. They had a media relations job uh, come open, and it became an opportunity for me to be able to combine both my career skill sets, in terms of my love of the outdoors and the environment, and then also my interest in media and the ability to tell stories. Um, so I came on board and immediately was able to start <coughs> doing a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that's wonderful about the aquarium, it was a, it was a rich resource in terms of all kinds of stories that had been untold. And in fact, it was refreshing from versus working in a TV environment. You had all kinds of people who didn't know that they had good stories. Um, and so they were fun to be able to work with. Well, so let me talk to you a little bit more about what the aquarium is. Um, the New England Aquarium is in downtown Boston. It's on the other side of the financial district. It was the first modern large aquarium in the world. Um, before, in the 1960s, if you had come to an aquarium before, it looked like a big uh, art gallery uh, with small uh, windows uh, that would have had tanks uh, with small fish in them, no naturalistic habitats, no interpretation, no large exhibits or anything like that. So when the aquarium came on board, uh, it was, uh, it, it, uh, introduced all those new concepts, and it basically just, uh, started a new era in terms of what was going on there. Aquarium also played an important role here in Boston in that uh, that part of Boston, uh, when you went there in the 1960s, was a highly unattractive area to be in. Um, it was essentially parking lots, broken down old wharves, and uh, the story I often tell is that uh, we, I used to get out of the hay market with my family to purchase wholesale groceries down there. And it was the kind of thing my father, who was very laissez-faire in, in terms of sort of supervision of us, would, would let us do what we wanted to. When, when we'd arrived in the area near the aquarium at the time, he'd give me a cuff in the back of the head and he'd tell me to stay close. <laughs> uh, and uh, the thing that was significant about that is that when the aquarium opened, it ended up revitalizing the entire urban waterfront. Um, in some ways, it was sort of like when you're going to build a mall and you need an anchor tenant and you're going to get a big department store. That's essentially what that economic model grew out of. And uh, what happened then was that all the residential skyscrapers in that area started getting built. Um, Faneuil Hall, Quincy Marketplace, was, uh, was revitalized and reopened in 1976. And it just went on and on from there. The most contemporary example of that is the world's largest aquarium now, which just opened in Atlanta, the Georgia Aquarium. That opened in 2007. A $325 million aquarium that was built uh, with a donation from the founder of Home Depot, Ernie Marcus. Um, and Marcus wasn't so much interested as a lover of aquariums, what he was, though, was he was a citizen of Atlanta who wanted to revitalize downtown Atlanta. And what he did was sponsor a huge study to see what best could do that, and they decided on an aquarium. Uh, and in the first year that the Atlanta Aquarium was open, they had four million visitors. And the big thing that they saw in terms of quality of life issues is that immediately, within six weeks, uh, the crime, uh, crime levels in downtown Atlanta dropped by about 40%. 
Again, there were those sort of neighborhood uh, aspects that were brought into a lot of urban neighborhoods where if you bring people, you bring vitality uh, there, and it'll start working from there. Uh, the aquarium is home to 30,000 animals of 750 different species. These are rock copper penguins from uh, South America. Um, we're particularly well known for our penguin colony, uh, and we have one of the larger ones uh, in, the, in the world, and we've got about 80 birds of three different species. <coughs> this also, uh, in terms of one of the animals that's probably best known here, and this is one of the, the crucial aspects in terms of what we do here, is this is called Myrtle Latour. She's uh, uh, probably an 80-year-old, 560-pound uh, green sea turtle. The importance of that name, Myrtle the Turtle, is, is that one of the things that when I came to the aquarium, the biologists in general, they're, they're trained to not to anthropomorphize, not to be able to assign human characteristics to animals. Um, and that's a fine line that you want to tread. Yet on the other side, the goal of the aquarium was to be able to engage people and have them care about conservation issues. And so in most of those cases, if you're going to tell a story, people don't become engaged until they start to identify. And so in this particular case, I often, I often would deal with biologists who wouldn't tell the public what the pet name of their animal was, um, but they would then confide to me. And then what we did is we, over time, got people to be able to talk to the, you know, to be able to talk to the public about the animals that they might name. Not all staff do it, but many do. And in this particular case, this is a very prominent animal, and we could be able to talk about her behavior. And then when we talk about her, her behavior, we could talk about the plight of green sea turtles in the wild. The other thing that's important about the aquarium is the aquarium's a big educational resource here in Boston. Um, we actually support over 3,000 teachers throughout New England with marine science curriculum and uh, training uh, workshops. Uh, we have about 150,000 kids who come through the aquarium each year and about 20,000 who come through on either reduced or free admission. And this is, the, the aquarium actually now is probably, when we opened, we were the largest aquarium in the world. We're now a medium-sized aquarium. Um, we've added on a couple times since then, but uh, our biggest problem is that we're located on a wharf, and so our ability to expand is limited. So what we do is we really pay a lot of attention to the quality of our programs, the, the density of our, uh, our, our animals. This is, in particular, is the aquarium is built around a, a four-story cylinder uh, called the giant ocean tank. It's a replica of a Caribbean coral reef. And in this particular tank, there are 750 animals of 150 different species. There are 10 foot long sharks in there. There are six foot long electric green moray eels, giant uh, uh, sea turtles, and hundreds of different kinds of tropical fish. And uh, one of the cooler jobs that you can have, and actually we have Northeastern co-op students here every, every semester, is that there are people who are professional divers. That's what they do all, you know, as, as their careers. That they literally, uh, they're diving that tank four or five times a day, feeding animals, checking on the health of animals, training animals, doing a variety of different things. But the other thing that the aquarium is, is that we're also one of the, um, one of the we're a significant marine conservation uh, organization around the world. Um, this is, in particular, we usually will be leading two to three, sometimes four expeditions around the world a year. We often work with National Geographic. Uh, in this particular case, this is a, uh, uh, an expedition to the Philippines, to an area called the Celebi CC. And uh, the, uh, the Engineering product to the right is, a, is called an ROV. It's a remotely operated vehicle. And so what that vehicle can do is it can sample, it can take pictures, you can add all kinds of instrumentation to it to do uh, all kinds of different things that you want to be able to do. And it can be remotely operated uh, with, in terms of being able to go much deeper than we could possibly go with divers um, and also be able to do it much safer. Um, so in this particular case, uh, we're, we're working in the area of the Selby Sea. This area was, uh, um, attractive to us because it had a relevance in terms of climate change. And the Celebi Sea is an area that's located right in between the Philippines and Indonesia and uh, some other large islands. And the thing that's unique about the Celebi Sea is that if you go to the lowest level of it, um, instead of the water cooling down like it does in almost every other ocean in the world, the water temperature is almost fairly constant from the bottom to the top. The significance of that is that at one time, uh, during our during the basic the age of dinosaurs, most of the oceans around the world had that feature. Um, very little, uh, no deep water survey had ever been done, so what we did is we went with the National Geographic, the Philippine government, and we did a deep water survey to be able to do a species uh, survey to see, well, what would climate change have looked like in terms of the kind of species that were distributed there, particularly invertebrates. Um, and in this particular case, we found about a dozen, 15 new types of species 
uh, and the papers, the scientific papers around that will come out uh, more shortly. And what that will do is that it will give paleontologists or also biologists who are looking at how uh, biologic communities evolve given their conditions, they'll have a better idea of how that can happen. And in this particular case, this is one of this is a, a squid and uh, um, some other things here. This is a, a, our fellow named Greg Stone, who's our chief scientist at the aquarium. Um, he has written about uh, six articles for National Geographic, uh, and we have an ongoing partnership with them. This area, this right here, these are table corals uh, that are found. You can find in basically healthy coral reefs around the world. Um, but one of the key things in terms of coral reef environments is that they're more and more under siege. In fact, we've had die-offs in coral reefs of about 20% just in a decade. Significance and the importance of coral reefs are coral reefs are the rainforests of the ocean. They're the place where you have the most dense species diversity. Um, they're the place that oftentimes is the, uh, the place that's the nursery ground for people to be able to come in and be uh, for, for different animal species when there are juveniles come in and be able to hide and be able to work very effectively. It's also an area where there's a lot of nutrition that's available. In this particular case, this is a shot from an area called the Phoenix Islands. Phoenix Islands are halfway between Hawaii and Fiji. And under the leadership of Greg Stone, the fellow that you just saw, we, we created the world's largest marine protected area um, just this past February. What a marine protected area is, is the equivalent of a national park on land. But that concept in terms of being applied, in terms of preserved uh, habitat being applied to the oceans is, is just beginning. Less than a quarter of 1% uh, of the ocean surfaces have been protected. In this particular, particular case, Greg Stone, uh, on an expedition about seven or eight years ago, had come across these particular coral reefs. They are so remote that in order to get there, you have to, take, you have to go to Fiji, which if you've ever been there, takes an inordinate amount of time flying, and then take a boat ride five days to the east. But they're the most pristine coral reefs in the world. When our divers went there and our divers hit the water, they literally came to the surface yelling, whooping, gasping. Uh, there was a density of sharks there that they had never seen anywhere before. Um, and it was out of excitement around that. So these particular kinds of corals are called table corals. Um, and again, that's a role that the, the, that, uh, the aquarium has played an important part of. Greg Stone essentially had gone to this particular nation that owns this, the nation of Kiribati, is a small third world country, undeveloped. It doesn't have a tourism economy. It essentially, uh, uh, beyond, it's all subsistence agriculture, but beyond that, what they derived their income from was selling fishing licenses to foreign fishing fleets, Koreans, Japanese, a uh, variety of Asian countries. And, uh, and what was happening is, is that it was having a, a larger impact in offshore waters. And so what we've done, and we've gone with other organizations, we've essentially created what would be the equivalent of a college endowment. The way that Northeastern has an endowment that's been given to it by its alumni, We've gone to wealthy patrons around the world to create an endowment for this particular marine protected area where the income from that can be used by the government instead of having to rely on the fishing license fees. Uh, first time that it's been done and it's been fairly successful. Expeditions also bring us around the world to Antarctica. Uh, about four or five year ago, years ago, you might have heard about the world's largest iceberg breaking off of uh, the Ross Ice Shelf. It was an area the size of Rhode Island. Um, and it started drifting northward. And the big question for oceanographers was that when you took essentially an ice cube that massive, what was going to be the effect on the environment around it as it moved northward? And uh, uh, in the aquarium, uh, again with Ge National Geographic, we went down and followed the iceberg uh, for a couple months being able to see and being able to sample in terms of what was happening. The big impact of that iceberg long term ended up is that it broke up into many smaller parts. Uh, icebergs that were essentially the size of the city of Boston. Uh, but what they did is they moved back southward, ground ashore on areas offshore, maybe three or four miles offshore, but in many cases they were in areas that they had huge penguin colonies. So it would be like uh, the iceberg basically coming offshore of Boston, having penguin colonies in the harbor where the penguins couldn't exit, where they would have to go enormous distances around the bergs to get to their food, source, or food sources. And in those cases we saw about a decline of 60 or 80 percent in some of those penguin colonies. Can anybody guess what this thing is? It's a whale. A whale? It is a whale. Uh, um, this is uh, the world's most endangered large whale. It's called the North Atlantic right whale. 
Um, and this, he, this animal is mostly a resident of Massachusetts. Spends about, there's, at, there's only about 400 left in the entire world. Um, and this particular whale, in terms of, uh, this animal would normally be about 55 feet long, very sturdy, probably weighs about 70 tons. Um, it's a plankton feeder that you find both east and, uh, uh, and north of Cape Cod in the spring and in the fall of the winter. In the, in the summertime, it goes up to Canada to the Bay of Fundy. These animals are so endangered, they were actually endangered before the great era of industrial whaling uh, that was based here out of Massachusetts in the 1800s. Um, if, you're not, if you're from Massachusetts, New Bedford, which is a very working class mill city now, at one time for 40 years was the wealthiest city in America. Uh, and the reason for it was it was the center of the sperm whale uh, trading business. Uh, and uh, Nantucket and New Bedford was the, were the center of that. This whale was almost extinct before the industrial era of whaling began. Um, they called it the right whale because it was the correct or right whale to kill. And the reason was in the 1700s, when you didn't have uh, much whaling technology first developed yet, what happened was is that these whales, were uh, because they're uh, surface feeders, they're always at the surface, they're so huge, they had a massive amount of blubber, that if I took, you, you're at, at that time, the way you would kill a whale is that you'd be out in a dory that probably would extend from here to that counter, have eight or six or eight people in it, and you'd have a hand harpoon that you would throw into that animal. Um, very risky business in terms of the animal potentially overturning the boat. Um, so there was a, a lot of effort that was involved in that. So what happened is, is that if they saw this particular kind of whale, they would, they would uh, go and attack that particular whale because this whale, once it was killed, it would always float. And so in particular, uh, in terms of the economic return on it, it was the right whale to kill. And by the early 1800s, most of these animals had been killed off. And in fact, up until the late 60s, early 70s, there were actually uh, Woods Hole scientists who thought that right whales were extinct. And then some New England aquarium scientists discovered uh, a, a pod of these whales uh, in the Gulf of Maine, the area between Cape Cod and Nova Scotia uh, in the late 60s. And since then, we actually have a team of about 10 or 12 scientists who've been working uh, steadily to protect these animals. Um, and this has been actually a large ongoing project in terms of what we do. The, the, over the last 12 years, the population's increased from about 300 to 400. But there's still real lack of genetic diversity within the, uh, the population. This is something that I all am continually working from, from a media point of view in terms of advocacy. The big thing that uh, these animals currently die from uh, they, they die most commonly from ship strikes. Um, what happens uh, in, in particular, the females when they're pregnant, um, they, all large whale species, what they'll do is the males uh, and the non-pregnant females will stay in their northern latitudes. But the mothers don't want calves born into water that's exceptionally cold. They don't want their, their newborns burning up calories, staying warm. And so what they do is they will swim to a tropical environment or to a, a warm temperate environment. In this case, North Atlantic right whales go down to the Florida Georgia line. Um, in the transit, we have ships. We have uh, usually in a given year two to four whales that are struck by ships. Um, one of, because they're an endangered species and protected by the Endangered Species Act for several years, we've gone through a process with the federal government to basically create rules that will better protect whales uh, uh, under that. Those rules were supposed to be implemented 18 months ago, and then what happened was is that the Bush White House had essentially obfuscated on it. They, they tied it up in the Office of Management and Budget on a business review, and it wouldn't come out. And then finally what happened with some of the work that we did in other organizations in terms of the media exposure to it, we were able to uh, move that along. Uh, and, and it was just announced two weeks ago uh, that the, the, the new rules protecting these whales from ships would get implemented. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the sea turtles that strand uh, each year on Cape Cod. In this particular case, these are Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, world's most endangered sea turtle. These guys, even as adults, will only get to be about 80 or 100 pounds, the, the white shell, um, versus lots of sea turtles will get up to 200, 300 pounds, depending on the species. Uh, so the, the myrtle, that large turtle you saw, she can go to six or 800. And there are even turtles that we've worked with a lot this summer off the New England coast, again, that can weigh a ton. They can be 10 feet in diameter. They're called leatherback sea turtles. They're essentially sea jelly eating machines. This particular event is, is that this is a, uh, what we'll do is as we get turtles in, we're essentially like Boston City, Boston Medical Center on a, uh, in the ER on a Saturday night. In two weeks, we'll be overwhelmed with turtles coming in. We'll literally be triaging them, identifying which turtles have got the best ability to survive. 
Um, there's only about 10,000 of these sea turtles surviving in the wild. And then what we'll do is as we stabilize them, we ship them to other sea turtle hospitals around the country. Then we'll also keep the hardest cases here at the aquarium. Um, and then what will happen is the following summer, uh, when the water's warmed up south of Cape Cod, we'll take, usually have to, around 12 to 20 of the most difficult cases that are ready for release. And what we'll do is we have a huge community-wide event where usually the people who discovered these turtles uh, on the beaches of Cape Cod will be releasing them. And we never announce it to the media, but there's always about six or 800 people there. And, uh, and it's really pretty inspiring because it's like a rock concert. When the turtles come out, people just start cheering. It's a, it's a story of survival, and it's also the kind of thing that, again, there's this weird thing that I never quite understand. Turtles have this universal appeal. Uh, uh, whether you look back in mythology or you know you look through you know contemporary uh, cartoons, um, and they have a, a big appeal around that. Uh, this is a, a case of a uh, harbor porpoise that's in rehab uh, right here, and uh, um, and this is what uh, some of the things that I've been speaking of in terms of what the aquarium is and does. Pretty large organization. Uh, we do about 1.3 million visitors annually. We can move up to 1.5 million uh, in a good year. Uh, the, a couple of key things, a large organization, about 225 staff members. 550 volunteers at the low end. It can be up to 800. It's equivalent. We get about 55 full-time uh, equivalent uh, man hours out of them, about 100,000 hours a year. Um, the other thing that we have, and it's something that you should do while you're here in Boston, if you're from outside the area, is that the aquarium also has a whale watch. Um, New Englanders are very jaded. We just think that whales are everywhere. Well, most people, if you live on the coast in 90% of the world, there aren't whales off your shore. Ironically, uh, here in Boston, 40 miles, uh, 25 miles east of Boston, 40 kilometers, less than an hour, hour's boat ride, is America's only whale feeding sanctuary. Um, there's a, one other whale sanctuary in Hawaii, and that's actually a whale a sanctuary for humpback whales. Uh, for, it's a cabin ground. In this particular case, you, in any one time from April through November, you'll probably have uh, 60 to 200 whales who are in an area that's probably a little bit larger than Boston, and they're feeding there. And the reason that they're feeding there is that there's an underwater plateau that comes up just north of Cape Cod. What happens is the cold water flushing down from Canada mixes with the warm water coming up from the, uh, the Gulf Stream, and all that mixing of the water creates an ideal environment for nutrients to mix and to be able to uh, uh, create uh, a food base for plankton, for both plant plankton and then also for animal plankton, and then it works on its way up the, up the ladder. This particular article uh, uh, is, uh, in this month's National Geographic, we actually have a big story that, uh, about right whales. Um, and this is, uh, uh, essentially the entire story is our, our scientists have been working with right whales for about 25 years. And this particular shot was taken, and uh, there was a big expedition to the islands south of New Zealand called the Auckland Islands. And um, this uh, photographer is actually from Worcester. He's a guy named Brian Scarry. He'll actually be giving uh, a talk at the, uh, at the aquarium on December 1st. He's one of the best underwater photographers in the world. And, uh, and one of the things that was unique about this was that this particular picture has become the rage on the web. Uh, you can see to the right is actually Brian's assistant. And what happened, and again, these whales are so unaccustomed to people. This area was so remote that these whales were literally reacting to people like as if they, they had never seen a person before. Mm -hmm. And in particular, they clearly had never seen a person in the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what happened is that this animal, which is about 65 feet long and probably weighs 80 tons, literally came down and was the way, you know, the way that a dog would come up to you. He was literally investigating that dive. Um, and so this is one of the images in, the, in this month's geographic article that, uh, and that Brian was able to shoot. The other one that we've had, we've had a good month at the aquarium, is that uh, our other project is on the cover of Smithsonian Magazine. Uh, and uh, this is an article that says in terms of our, our you know, the victory at sea, it's about the Phoenix Islands protected area. And it's introducing, again, conceptually, that idea to the public about the need for marine protected areas. That, uh, that the idea of national parks have existed almost for 150 years. Yellowstone in the West is the first national park, uh, national, uh, first park anywhere in the world in 1872 is created. Uh, marine protected areas, though, have just begun. This particular area, if you're a New Englander, in terms of the Phoenix Islands that I mentioned before, a lot of people know, might have a little clue in the back of their head. That's the area that Amelia Earhart, the great 
female aviator from the 1930s. That's where they believe her plane went down. So one of the big questions then is in terms of the skills that I bring, where I've got all these stories that are potentially there. Or how do I be able to do them? How do we, you know, how are new stories selected? Because I can tell you, oftentimes when I began, I thought that the way a story got to air, or the way that a story got there, is that it just needed to be a good story. But the fact is, is that that's not the case most of the time. There are a lot of factors that affect how a story is picked up, and, and if it is. Um, one of the key ones, as you can imagine, in terms of doing things, is just you, you knowing what an editorial focus is on there, what their style and philosophy is. Um, but there are also a lot of parts in terms of what are in terms of what are individual decision makers' interests. It's the kind of thing it pays for me to be able to know who the editor is, and it's the kind of thing spending time with him, knowing what he does, you know, on the side. The whole concept of water cooler talk is a completely legitimate idea. Um, what will happen? I always used to say that if a, if a, if if an event happens in a community, and if it's mentioned three times by three different people in a newsroom, that what will happen is that story, where that event as a story idea will emerge onto a story list somewhere in an editorial process. So what we can do in some cases, if when I even might do the more mundane things, if I'm opening a new exhibit, let's say on a, a, you know, a certain type of first deal, what I'll do in terms of just trying to, you know, I've got certain kinds of media that are obviously going to cover that, that you know, their tourism media, and I'm going to give them their standard exhibits and other stuff, but I really would like to get that in the news media. And maybe that, that's not going to be something as traditionally that I'll hit. So what I'll do in some cases, I'll, I'll send some of that information out. Um, but then the other thing I'll do is I'll literally send along you know, a plush, a, a stuffed toy of what that first deal looks like. And it's going to go to that. And people will enjoy that, or at the very least, even if they don't have kids, they're going to pass it to somebody else in the newsroom, and it's going to get mentioned. And by that very mention, all of a sudden, it's going to start building credibility. And the thing to remember in terms of story selection, it's all about human beings in terms of all their foibles and all their interests and all their biases. Um, and that actually can even work in terms of the other part of it. The other big thing, though, that I always want to mention is having worked in the newsroom is that I'm a big believer in paying attention to behavior. If I have the opportunity to go out and to be able to talk to people to say, uh, you know, if I get the opportunity to go have lunch with a reporter from the Globe, I'll go to the, you know, reporter from the Globe. Globe this week's got a whole new format. You know, in terms of they, they took all their entertainment and lifestyle stuff and they put it into one little tabloid pullout. Um, and so then the, and what they've done is they've consolidated a lot of departments. So one of the things that I really will need to find out more of over the next few weeks is what do people think about it internally? Who's making the decisions on what? Are there certain directions that you're trying to push that in? Um, and that's basically intelligence and information that I'll go from, from there. Another aspect, though, about behavior, though, is that newsrooms are ridiculously busy. They're ridiculously busy. You're overwhelmed with the amount of information that's coming from you that you have to triage and decide what it is that you're going to do something with. So an example, if I got to pitch a story, I have to be very respectful of that person's time. I've got to be able to get in and out and, uh, in terms of being able to tell them what it is the story that I'm trying to pitch. And if they're giving me a cue to end, uh, to end the conversation, I need to be able to do that. Um, another thing that we'll, we'll do is in terms of uh, an email, or let's say, media, believe it or not, right up until about a year ago, used to work very heavily on faxes. And so it was, the, ironically, well past what, what other people had, had done stuff. Part of that was, in many cases, media companies still are often undercapitalized. They won't get new technology until everything's set. Another aspect of it is that it was also just a hard copy that was easy and quick to file versus having to take the time to print. Um, but the other thing is, is that, as you guys are probably being prepared and told as you're getting yourself ready to apply for jobs, is that you know, when you put that resume together, what's the average length of time that a hiring manager is going to look at your resume at the first look? Probably eight seconds. That's about the time that they're going to give that. Same thing is true in terms of story, or in terms of even to be able to get somebody to open up my email, I've got to have a really good subject line. I've got to know that I'm going to give him five to eight seconds. I have to be able to lay that story out in headlines, subheadlines, or the lead sentence so that they know what that story is about in, a mili in, in about eight seconds. And then they'll either file it or, or, you know, or put it into a story that's got potential uh, that, that can potentially go there. Access is the other thing. Access oftentimes is just a matter of being able to, you know, it's a matter of contacts. Oftentimes it's difficult to be able to contact media companies, believe it or not. If you go onto a website or go onto any of the Boston television stations and be able to try to find a phone number directly into a newsroom, pretty hard to do. Um, 
So one of the key things around that is that when people have good ideas is being able to make that connection to be able to find somebody who might have that information. Or in most cases, if you're willing to be persistent, you can get the number. And in some of those cases, that's just literally calling into the number initially and then asking. You know, you're going to get transported four times, but then you'll eventually get to the, to the right spot. The final thing, and this has huge impact on story selection, are operational constraints. And what I mean by operational constraints are those things in a newsroom that, uh, that just take away choices from people in terms of what it might be the preferred stories that they work on. So an example might be is uh, uh, there could be a, a great story on the outer part of Cape Cod. Um, and if it's a weekday on Wednesday, uh, if it happens in the early morning, no problem. We're going to go out there. Because the average newsroom in Boston has got 10 reporters that are working there. They can afford to send somebody out there. But if that story happens on Cape Cod on Saturday afternoon, there are only three reporters who are working both shifts. And it's the kind of thing, unless it's a great story, I'm not going to take the chance that I'm going to have breaking news here in Boston while I've got a reporter down there. So, they, so that's at that point, that's where you're going to be able to work to be able to say, how can I deliver the story to them alternatively in terms of whether I shoot video myself, whether I get them interviews, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so distance is a factor, time's a factor. Um, there's a general rule of thumb that you'll see come up, never do anything in terms of a media event on a Monday. Um, it's a waste of time. Uh, it's a guaranteed, sure way for you to have a great story and not to be able to do it. I'll give you an example. Uh, three weeks ago on a Monday, um, it's a, uh, we had a, a, a media event at the Aquarium that was sponsored by the Bank of America and Massachusetts Cultural Council. A, a story that may or may not interest you, but it's relevant to a lot of people, is this, the whole concept of the disappearing field trip. Versus when you're a child going on field trips, you're, the, the, the students who are 10 years younger than you are going on many fewer field trips for a variety of reasons whether it's increased demands for standardized testing, cost of transportation, security, whatever it happens to be. Um, and so what's happened is, is that Bank of America was essentially setting up a big fund to subsidize bus transportation to cultural, uh, uh, cultural institutions. That was actually a reasonably good story that should have gotten some attention. I advised them against doing it. The key players they wanted to have there were only there on, uh, available on a Monday. We ended up having a really good event, fuck yes, zero media. And the reason for that, on a Monday, government's restarting. All the, uh, all the people who basically have cr committed criminal acts over the weekend are going to be arraigned. Um, and the other part of it is, is that, the, and just the bias again, the, the folks who are working weekdays are going to come in and they're going uh, to they're, they're going to graze over the best stories from the weekend. And even if those stories were done well, they're going to have the feel the need to retell them. And, uh, and so you're going to have that aspect of it as well. Uh, another aspect of it also can be, I mentioned in terms of staff members, can also be technology. Um, it might be the type of thing that uh, they don't have the ability in terms of a live uh, a vehicle to be able to do something in a timely way. Uh, or it could be the kind of thing that you just might have something in a format that they can't use. And so that's the other piece that you have to be aware of. Um, media targets. Um, the thing to remember is that if you are, have got a story, your story, when you're first presenting it, your audience is not your readers or your viewers. Your first audience is an editor or a reporter. Um, and that's the key thing to be able to keep in mind. It, you, and it might affect in terms of the way you structure your story and in terms of what you're trying to do. Um, and, and keep that in mind. Or also don't write your press release so that it's specifically for a, a mass market. It can change a little bit in terms of what you do. If you've got time, go online. If you've got somebody particularly in, in mind, um, let's, say, uh, let's say you're doing this great project here at Northeastern involving some kind of new media technology. All of a sudden you connect with a Globe reporter who's working with Hyal Octobray who does uh, technology stories. And you make that connection. If you're smart, you're going to get online and you're going to go to the Globe website and you're just going to you know, throw in Hiawatha's name to be able to uh, just see what his stories have been. What's his style? What's it, what has an appeal to him? Uh, and be able to work that. Um, the other thing that's important over time is to act as a resource. I probably half the calls that come into my office on a daily basis have got nothing to do with a potential story at the aquarium. It's a reporter calling me to say, hey, I just got to sign this story on marine science. I know you guys don't have anybody there, but can you tell me who the experts in the field are? And, uh, and I'll not, I usually don't even have those answers. What I'll do is I'll then have to take the time to contact our scientists, get that information back, but get it to them in a timely way. But then they're working for me and I'm working for them, and that's how we start to build a relationship. Other things about story, uh, about in terms of how stories work, I'm a massive believer in timing, timing, timing. Um, 
I, and you know what I mentioned before is that there are so many good stories that die out there because there's too much news competition that day. Um, there are too many stories to go. The thing to keep in mind is in a TV newscast, there's 22 minutes in a TV newscast. Um, if you add a story, generally a story is either going to go out or it's going to be reduced. So let's say Jamal is my reporter, and I got him already working on one story about 11 o'clock, I decide to reassign him. The story that Jamal is working on is either going to go away or else it's going to run, instead of a minute and 30 seconds, it's only going to run as for 15 seconds or 30 seconds. And so, so go from there. So there's a limited amount of stuff. Newspapers, a little more flexibility. If it's a heavy news, you can add, you, you, with time, editors can add pages. Um, doesn't happen as often, and particularly in this environment, it's not going to happen there. The web gives us more flexibility around that. Um, and, and that's evolving in terms of what we're doing. Um, and then in terms of marginal stories, uh, let me give you a, a two good examples of uh, what's happened to me in the last two weeks. Uh, I had a really great story in terms of uh, the Phoenix Islands story. The, the, the president of the Phoenix Islands who came to Boston. Uh, he was speaking at Harvard. He was uh, also going to be uh, getting an award at, uh, at the Aquarium. And then he was going to the United Nations. And he's specifically speaking at the United Nations. The islands that he inhabits are going to be the first global climate change refugees in the world. Most of the, he has 100,000 people who live on 300 islands in, in his area, and most of them live in, in areas 10, uh, less than 10 feet above sea level. Um, pro, they are literally making plans to relocate their people, and they're negotiating with governments to be able to do that. In this particular case, when because he came on a Monday, I probably spent five days around the clock working, and uh, I landed probably two or three uh, media outlets. Uh, um, a big NPR show called Living on Earth. But in terms of local interest, even the Globe couldn't get them there. It wasn't local enough for them. Um, and then I didn't have time and I didn't have the operation, I didn't have all the information I needed to, to try to do something on a national basis when they were in New York. Um, though, then last week, I probably took the silliest story that I worked with in weeks and managed to get it on every Boston TV station, have it run in the Globe for two days, be on the front page of the Metro. Um, be, Exactly. Be picked up by 60 TV stations across the country, be on Good Morning America, be on Fox News Channel, and Jamal just asked me five minutes ago if Inside Edition had called back. You know, <laughs> in terms of talk about silliness. And what the story was, was that we ran an ad campaign, uh, or we had a, 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 an ad company do a summer campaign for us. And what happened was we had our opening night of that, we invited some of the uh, people who worked on the campaign who were certified divers to dive in our giant ocean tank which is, if you're a diver, it's a really unique experience. And one of the divers, while he was in there, while he was dealing with Myrtle, who was sort of pushing him around, mm -hmm. and he was holding on something, he didn't realize it, but he lost his wedding ring. So later, when he's in the showers, you know, getting, you know, after the dive, he realizes he's lost his wedding ring. And so we go to look for it, we can't find it. We actually think that we'll probably find it, but three months passed, and we didn't find it. And in the meantime, he had gone out, and he bought a new wedding ring. Well, the Sunday before last, Somebody was down, uh, literally cleaning in the bottom of the tank with a vacuum cleaner, and saw a shape uh, that was a little unusual. We actually, a lot of times when you see unusual shapes, you think they might be shark's teeth. Shark are perpetually losing teeth, and what we'll do is we'll give them to kids when we come up as divers. And then what happens is that they saw it was round, they thought it was a coin, maybe somebody had thrown in, and nope, sure enough, he, it, was a, it was a ring, he knew it was the ring. And so in that particular case, we called. And the thing that was actually funny is having worked in the business, is that I knew that a lost wedding ring story is gold. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so even my boss and most of the people that we work with are all women. And they thought, well, it'll be a nice pickup. But I knew that it was going to be massive. The key thing that I did, though, that was also important with it is that we, we structured the story well. Um, one is that we, we, we put out, we, you know, we, we had a, a very strong press release. But the other key thing is that we created the setting, was that I made sure that the two guys didn't meet each other until I got them on the platform at the top of the giant ocean tank. And, and that he was going to show him where he found the ring. And uh, so in this particular case, uh, you know, that really silly story got that kind of massive coverage. But timing was important. If I had done that story in midweek, I wouldn't have gotten the same pickup. And the reason that it was, it, we did better was that it happened on Sunday. But we didn't do it until Thursday. And the reason is, is that news editors are just like you. You know, it's the kind of thing, if there's too much death and destruction or if you're tired of hearing about how bad the economic downturn is, by Thursday, they're looking forward to the weekend just the way you are. 
And their story selection has a bias where they start looking for features and for softer stories. Um, and so that's the, uh, the other piece that we work with with that. And that's what really made that story. The other part that happens with those stories is that if you've got a good story and you get it out there, particularly the way media is now integrated electronically, that story is going to then have legs. It's going to have a life of its own in terms of being picked up uh, by different outlets that will continue to come and come and go. My uh, president of the aquarium comes by with my office every morning and knowing that I busted out completely on having uh, a story for uh, our visiting uh, president from Kiribati, uh, comes in and says, well, how many more days do we run Inside Edition uh, for that type of thing? Uh, news environment. So one of the key things to do is how heavy is the hard news flow? If I've got a really good story I want to run that day, I literally get up at, a, at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I will see, I'll go get the Globe and the Herald, I'll get online, and I'll go see what the TV news store stations are previewing. I mentioned about Mondays or earlier. Um, and then there's also times that are, are, there are times that you can exploit in terms of a good story. Um, there it was a mayor of Boston back in the 1990s, a guy named Ray Flynn. Um, he was famous because he was smart enough, or somebody in his staff was smart enough, where he was able to push his agenda with the city massively, because all of a sudden he started having all these major media events on weekends, which no mayor had done before. And all of a sudden he had all this media space that essentially was pretty, it was also pretty uncensored. You got Skelton Cruz on weekends. So possibly the editor of, let's say, the Boston Herald, which may not have liked Ray Flynn, all of a sudden, and might have had some editorial influence in the way a story was presented, it was the kind of thing that all of a sudden now, some reporter was just writing it, and there was an editor who already had too much to do, who let the copy go through in terms of what it was. And so Flynn's message was very effective in terms of getting out there. Um, then there's also just slow times. Weekends have got greater opportunity, though you've got to be careful. You've got to make sure that they're accessible, and that you've got all the components that they need to do. Summertime, you know, you always hit it the summer doldrums at different times. You know, usually it's in August in terms of when you'll happen where it's just, you know, everybody's on vacation and there's not a lot happening in the world. Uh, and then other times it's just a slow new news cycle. Mentioned features play better uh, later in the week. And then uh, the other one is, is the story market ready for a change of pace. That's another thing is that sometimes you could have a day that's loaded with death and destruction. And it's the kind of thing if you have got a nice, excuse me, you got a nice short story. Um, that probably will get good play. Um, you probably have all seen it at the end of a newscast where they run the cute story. It's only 30 seconds long. It's a kicker. Um, that's what they call it. But it's the kind of thing you can also often time the kicker really well. Um, and particularly if you've got, you know, for me it's easy. I've got 30,000 animals that I go pick out from what, what, you know, what's interesting that's going to happen. And I'll try to tie it to something. Um, I mentioned our operating constraints. So a couple things that are important. Sometimes the mistake you can make is that you don't get the story into the hopper uh, um, early enough. Or in some cases, you get it in too soon. One of the things that was really uh, important for me is that um, it, it, an example is oftentimes you'll use what's called embargoes um, in uh, the news media. Media alert goes out and say the story's not supposed to run until this date. Well, it's not legally obliged to, to be able to do that. Once the story's out, the story's out. Most people will respect it, but lots of people, in terms of trying to get a leg up on each other, might break it earlier than, than, than another. So you have to sort of work with that. Um, the thing that I'll try to do usually is if I've got a story that's going out, I'm going to usually put my story out in the evening after, uh, after I know that the, the print uh, news media is essentially all the story reporters have filed their stories and going to bed unless they work in the evening, and that the TV folks are done. Uh, and the TV folks are done at 6 o'clock. Because the other thing is I might let it run at 11 or in terms of what they do. But also in TV, it's called a, a news cycle. A story is good for about two to three sessions worth of repeats. So what will happen is if I get a really good story out there and it hits at noon, it'll run at noon in two, for two minutes. It'll run at 6 for a minute 30. At 11 o'clock, it's going to run for 30 seconds, and then it's gone. Um, so that's the other piece that, that I have to sort of work on. In some cases, I'll also just get up very early in the morning and distribute to that. Because on the other side, again, knowing what operating constraints are, if you decided you were to work, you're going to work in TV as a producer, as a news producer, and you're going to be, the first job you're going to have is working the overnight shift. Yeah. And uh, um, because that's the space that nobody wants to work. And it's going to be that you're going to be working those shows from 5 to 7 AM. Well, that producer is going to come in at about 1 o'clock in the morning, maybe 12. Um, the one thing that that producer hates is that essentially all that she does, and most of the producers are women, are, are, she's just breaking up those stories that ran from the, uh, the previous night and just sort of putting them in a new format. Because there's not much new stories coming overnight. If you can bring new content into that newsroom that's unique to her, oof, 
you know, it's going to run uh, in terms of what you do. Uh, the other one we talked about, um, you know, when are there editorial meetings? Uh, an example, another big thing to know, in TV in Boston, editorial meetings are usually between 8.30 and 9. So if your story didn't get in there early, unless it's, it, 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 what happened is that if it didn't make the initial queue, they're going to decide initially what the lineup is for the day. Now what's going to happen is that there are going to be two or three people who are going to have the flexibility of being able to bump stories. They're going to be the, the news editor and probably a couple producers. Um, so that if something breaks, they'll decide that, okay, those stories that we're going to break, this story to be able to give up this one to go to that one. So that's important in terms of TV, it's 8.30 to 9. New, uh, newspapers and print media are much later. Um, they're usually going to be filing at 7 o'clock at night. Um, so a lot of those folks don't come in, they don't have to come in until 10 or 11. Some of them will come in, most of them will come in at 9. But it's the kind of thing, I generally am not even trying to call newspaper reporters until around 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, went down and we talked about uh, some of the other uh, constraints that we have there. And finally, just what are their deadlines in terms of when they've got to hit. And that's an important question. When you have a reporter call you, once you, you know, and you've got a, a sense of what he's trying to do with the story, or you're even trying to pitch the story, the, the, the last question you should ask him is, what is your deadline? Um, so that you understand what they're working under around that. If it's the kind of thing that they, they're, if they work with you and you can't hit those marks for them, they're not likely to come back as, as well. Again, another thing about timing, uh, trends, uh, is be opportunistic. When I talked about the value of being a good generalist sometimes versus being a specialist, um, it's the kind of thing I often will say is that my knowledge of like a lot of things in the ocean is about an inch deep, but it goes all across the ocean. I can connect things in many different places. And so that has value. All of a sudden, it's the kind of thing I'm talking to a particular scientist about something that's really pretty arcane and cryptic, but all of a sudden I can back an aspect of that story out maybe to something that's a, a hot topic in terms of a trend that he's happy to be doing. So that, that is a value to that. Other things I can be doing is just literally tying things to just things that are happening, to weather. You know, it's the kind of thing, if, it, if it's been ungodly hot for three days, it's like, you know what, I'm going to go check and see if the, uh, if the seals have got fishicles, you know, and if that's going to make a thing, something as silly as that. Or it can, uh, you know, be worked on the other side where uh, it might be something in terms of the holiday season where uh, we could be talking about when we're good, we've got a big focus on climate change where, you know, we're talking about alternatives to sort of material buying for the holiday season. And you can just keep working back and forth. Sporting events coming up. Uh, NFL Films is coming uh, to shoot at the aquarium. Say, I, mean, I literally deal with every kind of media that you can imagine. Um, and they're coming to the aquarium because uh, on Thursday, November 3rd, the Patriots play the Jets on the Thursday night national game. So what they do is they shoot all kinds of flavor video around the city that they're going to. So we're going to shoot that, but we're going to make sure that we make the cut. And the reason we're going to do that is I've got a SEAL who's working on training on picking up footballs. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> to be able to do that. And again, it's silliness, but it's also fun in terms of that. It can change uh, what you do. Uh, story idea development, we're talking in relevance. Um, the other thing that, in terms of if you're working for an organization, don't rely on the tried and true. Walk around. You know, there's like some stangs in terms of really good managers walk around, really good story editors walk around. And, and what will happen, uh, it, I can tell you that every time I get my office is in a different building than the aquarium. Every time I walk over to the aquarium to talk to somebody face to face to find out, usually to fact check or to do something on a story angle, every time I go, I will find a new story uh, as I walk through the hall and talk to somebody and see what's happening. Um, and the other one is that the other thing is encourage the people that you're working with to pitch ideas that it's okay. Often for them, it's a mysterious process and they're really unsure you know, how that works or people just see television cameras. And, just don't understand how they got there. Um, content generation. One of the really key things, and this is the things that I'll, I'll really, really emphasize, is that you have to think like a producer. If you're putting together a media event, you have to think of what are the components that go into that. Um, one of the key things, obviously, is you need interviews. You need images. Either images you're going to provide or images that they can shoot, whether they're electronic or video. Um, in some cases, I'll have certain things go on that uh, there might be risk involved in terms of having them there. We might have an animal that we're handling. There's physical risk to have too many people nearby. We might have a, like a 16-foot anaconda that we're working with. Or I might have an animal that's undergoing this really unique surgery. But it's the kind of thing, it's like, you know what? That animal dies. I don't necessarily want that story out there. So what we'll do is we'll shoot the video ahead of time, shoot it ourselves. Then, when the animals in recovery are doing well, 
we'll invite people in and be able to do that. So then I can provide that kind of thing. Another operating constraint, though, that you have to know is, if you're dealing with TV stations, are they a union shop? Can, will some, in some cases, if a videographer has the ability to shoot, to shoot the video, the only video that can make air is union shop video, unless there's a unique circumstance. So you have to sort of know that. Um, having good background material for people um, is also key. And then just having a good setting. The other reason that wedding ring story worked in terms of it being silly was that, you know, I initially was just thinking, oh, I'll just have them interviewed, and that, then all of a sudden it was like, hold it, I've got a giant ocean tank, let's get these guys together. And I even debated whether to have an underwater videographer there. Um, so think like a producer and write for your reader. Um, you cannot, the vast majority of press releases in, or introductory material that goes out to news media is horrific in terms of the way it's written. And it's not that it's not, not grammatical, it's not anything else, but it has a complete flavor that is focused on the institution that's sending it out. It's loaded with corporate speak, it's loaded with uh, uh, you know, long titles of people. You know, you know, if, I've got, uh, by, if I have somebody who works with penguins, well, their formal title is probably, you know, uh, Bird Aquarius Level 3. You know, well, no, they're a penguin biologist. That's what they are in terms of that. But you'll particularly, I'm sure Northeastern probably does this a lot as well in terms of when you get, uh, you know, big things. Lose the corporate speak. Focus on the reader and what the reader is interested in. Um, or the other one that you'll commonly see at press releases is that people will throw in, uh, you know, long paragraphs about what the institution's about. Completely useless, and in fact, it distracts from trying to pitch your, your story angle. You can provide that on the backside once you get the hook. Um, and the other thing is that it's got to be pithy and it's going to be short. And if you're starting to run longer than the page, you're probably getting into dangerous territory. Um, interview guidelines. Oftentimes, you know, all of a sudden the TV camera shows up and it's like, we're going to interview you. And you talk to, uh, to staff. And staff are often very, very nervous. And the very the, the, the number one thing you're going to you know, is to emphasize to them what's the nature of the story. Generally, you're not going to have anybody who's going to be interviewed unless it's a story that essentially the media is very interested in in a positive way. Um, so in that particular case, you just advise that in terms of a little training you do with them. Is number one, it's called editing, something that Thomas does here. Um, <laughs> that it's like, you know what, if you fumble, don't worry about it. They're, they're going to make you look good. But the other thing, though, that is important in general is that my, I have two rules, and I actually learned these from the Coast Guard when I worked uh, as a news editor. The Coast Guard in the late 1990s had this amazing string of media coverage. And what they did was all those uh, crews that are out there in helicopters rescuing people, somebody had the brilliant idea that we're going to give those guys Super 8 cameras and those women, and we're going to train them in some very basic technique on how to shoot. Um, and then we're going to, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll have an editing suite available off the helicopter each one of those comes in. And what they do is every time they do a rescue, and they do a lot of them. You know, generally you only heard about the most dramatic ones, but they would shoot that video and then they would get it out the door and they literally used to leave it underneath the mailbox down in the financial district. So it was the kind of thing if you were the overnight news producer, you would send somebody a taxi to go pick up a tape out of a, a box underneath the mailbox. But it was great video of, you know, somebody, you know, coming out of a storm, coming up a, a litter basket. But there are things that, the key things that they would tell their folks to do is that they only spoke to what they knew. So in this particular case, they, those Coast Guard people only spoke to the rescue. They only spoke to the things that they were trained in. Um, if somebody asked them questions outside of that, they would say, I don't know, but let me help you find that out. And so those are really two key concepts. Oftentimes people have lots and lots of media training. I'm a real wrong, strong believer in some cases keeping it simple. Speak to what you know, and I don't know is a fine answer. Follow up if possible. Don't speculate. People love to ask the what if questions, you know, or around what if, uh, around those types of things. Generally avoid them, or they'll ask you in some cases to answer for a third party. And uh, in most of those cases, you'll say, well, well, what do you think that person would was probably thinking, you know, or you know, what would have been the motivation to go be out on a boat in those kind of conditions? And that's the kind of place that you don't know. Um, here's our infamous wedding ring story on uh, Channel Seven. UPI for people who aren't around is uh, 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 a big international wire distribution, and, and it just went on and on. This one was funny. I knew that that, pro that that event was really well structured because all the advertising trade blogs, the three most prominent ones, all said stupid news media. It was a publicity stunt. It was created by us. And, and I actually don't normally deal with the ad trade press. I was not ready to say, no, you know, it was a genuine thing. And then my boss, who used to work in advertising in New York, said, 
uh, it's, it's, it's great just the way it stands. You know, and they'll also chew you to pieces if you respond and do anything more. But that's where we knew that we had done well on that. Another story that we had come up, uh, little blue penguin chicks. This woman on the left, uh, we, had, uh, uh, we, we hatch out about 15 to 20 penguin chicks a year. Um, and these are uh, uh, penguin chicks, or these are actually full-grown, or they're the chicks that are now full-grown. Uh, they're from Australia and New Zealand, they're called Little Blues. And uh, we have a penguin chick uh, that when it hatched, get rejected by its parents. And so this woman on the left, along with another colleague, every day uh, for about six weeks this summer, she would leave the aquarium in what looked like a little lunch bucket, but it was a heated lunch bucket, and she'd bring a penguin chick about that big home. Uh, to be able to care for it overnight the way you'd have to care for an infant because the chick would have to be fed every three or four hours. That particular story, when we did it, again around timing, we could have done that story any time during those six or eight weeks. We waited, we waited, we waited. We did it the week of Mother's Day. And we did, surrogate, uh, uh, we did it as a term of surrogate mom, penguin chick story. It ended up running with Associated Press around the country with a big photo gallery. MSNBC picked it up. NBC Nightly News picked it up. And, it went from there. and you know what? It's 1 o'clock, and I'm going to finish I know that a lot of guys probably have to go. Have to go. You want to take some questions? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm wondering um, what happens to these good stories that don't make the deadline? Do they end up in LexisNexis or the blogs or just strip down to the bottom of the ocean? Well, it depends on how widely you distribute it. Um, the big thing that I really like to do to take first people to do is to recycle it. You know, if it can. If it, in some cases, something will have a time element to it. And it's really, the other key thing is, you know, in the business, it's called a news hook. You want to know what's, you know, what's new about it, what's current about it. In some cases, you might use the news hook. More often than not, a good story will, you're just going to have to wait. It'll cycle around again, and it'll be another news hook that'll come in. Um, so you just sort of have to, you know, you can wait on it, reformat it. Or what you could do is then you can also, you could put it out, the beauty now is, like, for us, what we would probably do is we put it on an aquarium blog. And, uh, and then push it out to niche trade uh, press. And it might be we go to you know, uh, aquarium trade uh, things or sustainable fishing or whatever it happens to be. Um, but generally, the market is still mass media in terms of the biggest hit. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, and what we have to do is that uh, we'll, we'll basically go to them and say, if, do we have the, the data to support that, or do they have the data to support it? And then what will happen is that we then make a decision in terms of how involved we'll be on an advocacy level um, based on the science. Do you find yourself using or, or suppressing some stories because you'd rather use a more fluffy one? Or, um, you know, because it seems like there's a lot of bad environmental news out there. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I assume that you know that the aquarium is no exception. Yep. There is definitely um, disappointing and yep. sort of sorry stuff that comes out. I think uh, probably the no, I wouldn't. If you answer your first question, whether it's present, no, I wouldn't. I'm usually always if I get good stories, I'm just trying to heal the time out. But sometimes though, I might have a story that I really would like to do, and I, I may not do it because I'm pushing a fluffy story because I'm literally just trying to drive attendance to the gate with visibility of the press. Um, and so the timing might not work on that. The big thing, though, that, around what you said, though, is that I'm actually a big believer in, I think one of the lessons that was learned from the 70s onward is, is that when you give people a drumbeat of, of ongoing negativity, they become inert to it. And so you have to go out and tell them what those success stories are. So in the case of, like, if I'm talking about right whales or am I even talking about seals here in New England, I mean, you can go down to Cape Cod right now, uh, and there are places that you can go and see a thousand seals at once. When I was a boy, you couldn't see one seal at once on the New England coast. And the reason for that is that in one of the big laws of the uh, uh, 70s environmental movement was the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which protected whales and seals and all kinds of marine mammals. But now, now a good question, though, on the backside that I'll talk, tell you about is that now we actually have seal levels on Cape Cod that are probably at nuisance levels, that fishermen have a legitimate complaint. And so now what's happening is, is that there's a, a grassroots movement among some places try to get an exemption to certain federal laws in certain areas. And there are, and a lot of people, in, in many cases, people are afraid of opening the door a little bit. And so we'll often debate in terms of what we will say. Or it evolves over time. Or the other big example I can also give you is that uh, a fun thing that I get to do is every July, every the last week of June, I get to be a shark educator. Um, what happens is that you can, and I, I'm, Guarantee you, any one of you could do it as well, is if you develop a shark story the last week of June, 
uh, and run it at the press, it will run because people are obsessed with the idea they're going back to the beach. And even though Jaws was shot at Martha's Vineyard here in New England, we haven't had a shark death in 70 years. Um, you know, and we probably have had two attacks in that time. And so what happens is that uh, it sort of go, you know, it'll go there. One of the things that's happened over time, though, is that we do have great whites that show up. Last summer we had a couple of great whites show up there. The big thing, that, my message that I'm trying to get people out there is to say, that's normal. That's, the, that, that's a good, that's an indication that the environment's improving in that area. That's their traditional habitat. We're not on the menu. Great white's not interested in us. But what he is interested in is in a big 300 pound seal. That's what he's interested in. So if you are down at the elbow of the Cape, um, it's the kind of thing that off the elbow of the Cape is a huge national wildlife refuge with about 10,000 seals on it. And so what's happened is, is that we know 10 years ago, most of the great whites were feeding primarily on whale carcasses floating around in the ocean. But what's happened in the last 10 years, their diets, they'd rather eat something nice, light, and juicy than something dead and, you know, and stinky. Uh, they're switching over to seals. So what's happening is we've got more great whites who are cruising the beaches at near, let's say, Chatham and the elbow of Cape Cod. We didn't talk about that two summers ago. Now we start talking about that in terms of matter-of-factly uh, getting there. But part of that is that people's attitudes towards sharks have changed in the last five years. It's the kind of thing people will realize it's like, oh yeah, they closed the beach because there are sharks nearby. But those shark species aren't um, traditional, uh, you know, they don't attack people, and that's their habitat. We're going in the water, we can deal with it for a little while. And at first it was the kind of thing the Chamber of Commerce, you know, we used, we'd see in jobs and scream, oh no, we can't close the beach, we're going to lose all that money. Well, the irony now is, is that when you close the beach because there are sharks there, more people come. <laughs> that poor manatee came up about a month ago. That was a big story um, all over. But did anybody ever find out why or how it got up there? And the, I mean, several manatees have come up before, but I've never been able to find out why. Well, now you've got a, here's a good question. It ties in a little bit to your question as well. Is uh, there is speculation, are we going to see more manatees? Uh, the, the agent, we weren't involved in that particular rescue, and, and I'll tell a little bit of backstory around it. Um, is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service handles manatees. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, after that manatee died, actually told us that they think that we'll see more manatees in the future. Um, they won't attribute it specifically to climate change. And I think that that's probably, it's much too small a sample to be able to do it. But we're seeing more of it. Um, the, we did see a manatee in 2005. I actually think it was the same manatee. Um, what well, you'll commonly see with marine mammals that go into bizarre places, you know, a whale that'll swim with the Sacramento River, or we'll have two uh, adolescent right whales swim in Cape Cod Canal, that type of thing. Or we actually had a humpback whale literally come behind the aquarium. Uh, liter uh, if you, I'm trying to think of, if you guys know the new federal courthouse in Boston, or where uh, James Hook Lobster was, there was a humpback whale 100 yards off the dock at James Hook Lobster uh, three springs ago. So when those animals do that, they're usually younger animals. But the uh, thing with the manatee in this case is he probably was a younger animal. He needed to have been taken out a long time before. And in this case, it actually was a little bit of nothing intentional. But what happened is, is that the people normally involved in the rescues weren't involved because this animal had, he was a freshwater animal technical. Man manatees will be in both fresh and salt water. So he wasn't being handled by the National Marine <coughs> Fisheries Service. He got north of Cape Cod. When he got north of Cape Cod, we were jumping up and down, screaming, saying, you got to get him out of the water because he's not going to be able to figure out how to get back. And also, we're more familiar with chronic hypothermia than the agencies that were, we were dealing with in D.C. They were hoping, they, they always never like to intervene. They don't like to take an animal out of the water. Wildlife quite literally can die from the stress of being handled by people. As you can imagine, for millennia, most wild population, wild animals have known that if they have contact with people, it usually means the end of their lives. And so what happened in this particular case was that they were hoping they wouldn't have to intervene. We felt differently that it had to be intervened earlier. And then what happened was that uh, um, they had hoped to fly it out, and then that fell through. And, uh, and then the animal just, you know, it was, we, when we, we said on Wednesday before the animal came out, we knew that the likelihood that it would survive was probably around 30%. And the mistake, actually, that the, uh, the local group that was dealing with him, once he got rescued, they were, they got him out of the water, there was a euphoria that, oh, they got him out of the water and they helped to rescue him. But at that point, what they did is they didn't have enough clinical information to know, to, to really adjust expectations. They needed to lower expectations on the public's part, because people got so excited about it. Um, but it was the kind of thing to be able to say, yeah, but at this point, it still doesn't look good. Uh, but what happened then was that people's expectations went way up, 
And then they got slammed uh, in the media, uh, particularly at a grassroots level, when the animal died unexpectedly. And to tell you the truth, operationally, it wasn't done well. Uh, there were a lot of things that uh, just weren't done well in terms of, they didn't use all the resources they had available to them. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming today. This was a very, very stimulating talk. I learned a great deal. I know everyone here did. And this is the inaugural event for our studio talk. So I look forward to seeing you again. And thanks again. Thank you.